it's interesting because now that I have a body of work and I look back, I can see that there are many similar plot lines that run through my novels especially. It's often about a journey. It's often about a social justice issue. So if you were to say to me, do you do this consciously, I would probably very defiantly say no. But on some subconscious level, I think that there is this desire to stand up for the, the downtrodden or to talk about women's issues and to integrate social justice issues in my stories. That's author Pam Munoz Ryan. And this is Artworks, the weekly podcast produced at the National Endowment for the Arts. I'm Josephine Reed. Pam Yunos Ryan has written over 40 books for young people, including picture books and middle grade and young adult novels, which have become staples in classrooms, libraries, and in many homes across the country. Her list of prizes and awards is staggering. They include a Newbery Honor, the Human and Civil Rights Award from the National Education Association, the Virginia Hamilton Literary Award, and the Penn USA Award. She casts a wide net in terms of subjects from the childhood of Pablo Neruda in The Dreamer, to a young kid living in a trailer in Oklahoma in Becoming Naomi Leon, to a young Mexican girl forced to emigrate to the United States in the 1930s in Esperanza Rising, probably her most popular book. Written over 15 years ago, Esperanza Rising put the publishing world on notice that Pam Munoz Ryan was an author of great distinction. A fabulous storyteller, whose lyrical prose captivated young adults and older ones, too, including me. Esperanza Rising is a classic. I gave it to my godchild. And it's a very special book for me because it was her pathway book. We started off reading it together, and then she ended up reading it on her own, finishing it. Thank you. It's really lovely. Do you mind giving me a thumbnail sketch of it? The story of Esperanza Rising. Well, Esperanza Rising is the story of a young girl who grows up very wealthy and well taken care of and very well loved on a ranch in Aguascalientes, Mexico. Her father dies. It is a period in history where property is not left to women. So she and her mother become outcasts in the family and the uncles inherit the land and a series of circumstances occur that forces them to immigrate to the United States. They have employees that have worked for the family for years that are going, and so they go along. And the mother sort of embraces it as their only way out and their only way of being together. And Esperanza is challenged by her demotion in society and in the pecking order of her upbringing. So she ends up in a migrant farm labor camp with many people she doesn't know and without her father and with only her mother to rely on, and she has to learn to work and to survive. It's based on the life of your grandmother. Yes, it parallels her immigration journey from Aguascalientes, Mexico, to the segregated farm labor camps in the San Joaquin Valley in 1930. It is a work of fiction, but it does follow her journey very closely. And many of the circumstances are, are the same or very, very similar to what she experienced. Did you grow up on your grandmother's stories? Um, I grew up in Bakersfield, California. I was fortunate to have both of my grandmothers close by, and especially my Mexican grandmother, Esperanza, just a few blocks away. So I spent a lot of time with her. And she spent a lot of time telling me about what her life was like in the camps near Bakersfield, California. But she never really talked much about Mexico. And it wasn't until I was a grown woman with children of my own, and she would come and stay with me sometimes for several weeks at a time, that she began to open up about what her life was like before she made it to California. And I began writing those stories down because I was at that point in my life where I knew that I was going to lose them if I didn't write them down. And what was her life like in Mexico? She grew up with a very privileged life in Mexico. One of her uncles was uh, the mayor of Aguascalientes. Um, she grew up in a, at a big ranch. She grew up with privilege. So when she came across the border to the United States, it was a very different scene for her. 
And what happened when she came here? Why did she come here? Is it like the story of Esperanza Rising? It's similar to the story of Esperanza Rising in that her father did die. A series of circumstances occurred in her life that forced her to flee across the border. She was facing basically a life of poverty if she stayed in Mexico. Property was not left to women. And so she immigrated and ended up in the Giorgio Farms in Arvin, California, working in a migrant farm camp. How old was your grandmother when she came to the United States? She came when she was, I believe, about 17 or 18 and she stayed, she lived in the camps for about five years. In the book, she's much younger than the story of her real life. So the story of Esperanza Rising, the book, is backed up a little for the age of my reader. What made you decide, Pam, that you wanted to shape a book around your grandmother's experience? Well, I had written one novel beforehand, and I was talking with my editor and about what my next project would be. I thought that Esperanza Rising would be a very simple picture book story about growing up with my grandmother. And as I began to write this story and show it to my editor, my editor said, you've got a lot more to say here. You know, would you consider doing this as a novel? And that's how it came about. And, you know, the other part of that is, as a writer, when I went and pulled out all of these stories that I'd written down when my grandmother had come to stay with me when my children were little, it had all the premises for a great story. You know, it had a a beginning, a middle, and an end, and it had all the drama of the journey and all the things that happened to her along the way. So all of a sudden, I had a full box of premises from which to draw and develop. Did she talk to you about doing farm labor and living in the migrant camps? Well, I sort of grew up knowing all about her experiences in the camp because, first of all, the town of Arvin was very close to Bakersfield. She had many, many friends with whom she had stayed in touch when she had lived there. And she had a community of friends, even after the camps went by the wayside, with whom she talked and went to weddings. And so I was very cognizant of that connection and why she was close to all of those people. So I just sort of grew up knowing about them. And I also had uncles who worked in the sheds during the summer. So that whole lifestyle was just sort of matter of fact and something I sort of took for granted. You paint such a vivid picture of life in that camp. Oh, thank you. Both the the difficulty of it, but also the great community that it could build as well. Well, you know, I was very fortunate because I had family, obviously, my my grandmother, you know, lived in the camp, but there were also other people that were still alive. When I wrote Esperanza Rising, my grandmother had already passed away, but I was able to find other people who lived in the camp and interview them. And then, of course, I had the great resources in the Bakersfield Library local history room. And so there was many articles about strikes and conditions. And then my father was alive at the time, and I went home a few times and he took me out and we drove the area and he showed me exactly where the camps were and what it looked like. So I I had a lot of first person accounts. And then I had relatives who had worked in the sheds who could tell me things about, you know, cutting potato eyes and things like that. So I was really fortunate in that there were many people still alive who could really give me information. The book, I think, was also remarkably sensitive to labor issues. The strikers labor organizers who who wanted to form a union and go out on strike, the real ambivalence about many of the immigrant workers about that. It's so multifaceted, and I think you did that so well. Can you talk about writing that part of the book? Well, I think that my goal about that was to not take a side, but to show all sides so that the reader could have some empathy for the people that were striking, certainly for the conditions, for the people that were more self-actualized and could understand how much better their life could be, but also for the people who were just arriving and lived with the terror that they might be sent back and who were at a completely different level, that were more on a survival level of roof over the head, food in the mouth. So I really wanted to portray both sides of the issue. And I've had teachers tell me that they divide their their classes in half 
and they give one side one issue and one side the other issue, and they have quite heated discussions about what they would have done or what should have been done. So that really was my goal. There was a ruthlessness in if immigrants and anybody of Mexican descent who could have been born in the United States, if they were caught striking, they were sent back to Mexico or sent to Mexico. Right, regardless of whether they were American citizens or not, that's true. The repatriation was a very real, real thing, and it was many sweeps were done, and it didn't matter if people had papers or not. It was just, it was 1930, 31. This was the approach then. At the end of your books, you often have an afterword in which you give readers the background that informs the story you've written. And at the end of Esperanza Rising, you discuss the Mexican Repatriation Act that took place in the 1930s. It's surprising how little known this is. Would you please tell us about it? Well, I don't have my book right here with me to reference that. But in essence, the Repatriation Act was an effort by the government to, I believe, control immigration or dissuade immigrants. They would do roundups or sweeps of areas where many Mexican Americans worked. Um, remember, this was the beginning of the Great Depression. So I think that it was the government's philosophy that they were taking jobs away from Americans, although in retrospect, it seems that they weren't necessarily. So they would do sweeps and roundups and repatriate them to their own country, which was Mexico. That's basically it in a nutshell. And many people who were repatriated were already American citizens, whose families had been American citizens for many years. But because they, quote, looked Mexican, they were sent back. I have it right here. You said between 1929 and 1935, 450,000 Mexicans and Mexican-Americans were sent to Mexico. Right. That number is probably conservative. Yeah. And that's what you say. The next sentence is some historians think the number is closer to, is closer to a million. Right. And there were even circumstances where they were sent back, and yet they never spoke Spanish. They, they only knew English. It was a part of our history that's been neglected. But, you know, you'll find that in a lot of my historical fiction. And I'm very drawn to little-known episodes. Well, the book that followed Esperanza, Becoming Naomi Leon, yes. sort of blends both sides of your family. Tell, me, tell us the story of, of that book. Well, Becoming Naomi Leon, first of all, you say blends both sides of my family. So my grandmother, Esperanza Ortega, was born in Aguascalientes, Mexico. And I grew up in Bakersfield, California, with her very close by, in a big extended family, Mexican family. My mother married my stepdad, who I consider to be my real father, Don Bell, when I was about four years old. And his mother was from Oklahoma. So I had a Mexican grandmother and an Oklahoman grandmother. And we saw her a lot. We saw her every single Saturday. And so she was also an, an influence in my life and all of those Oklahoma sayings and, and her personality and the humor. You know, I was privileged to have, have that, to have that Oklahoman sensibility. And so in Becoming Naomi Leon, it's the story of Oklahoman grandmother, a great grandmother who has been raising these, these two children. And at the end of the first chapter, there's a knock at the door, and their mother, who's not been in their lives really since they were babies, appears. And so it's the story of the great lengths that this Oklahoman grandmother will go to to protect these children. And it, it also combines your Mexican roots as well, because Mexico figures very prominently in this story. Their father's Mexican. Right. Their father is Mexican, and... The grandmother, when I say she goes to great lengths to protect them from this, this mother who has a lot of needs and a lot of dysfunction, part of that is that she takes them to Mexico to find their real father so that she can meet with him and they can figure out a way that these children can stay with her. You're so good about getting inside a kid's head. Oh, thank you. I just loved, I think it is at the end of the first chapter or the second chapter, very early on in the book. And the way Naomi knows there is real trouble is because her grandmother leaves the house with her curlers on in the middle of Wheel of Fortune. 
And it's like, <laughs> oh, my God, this is bad. And it, that is I, – I just think that observation is so wonderful, and it gives us such insight into, A, that grandmother, but also Naomi. Well, yeah, I think sometimes, too, I think we forget that children have so many clues about what adults are feeling, and they know – and pick up so many, so many of our gestures and idiosyncrasies, and especially for Naomi, who's had a very sort of controlled life with her grandmother, and a grandmother who has done things very routinely, has never left them. You know, their life has been pretty programmed, and so when it becomes a tad bit unprogrammed, Naomi knows she suspects something is wrong. You know, it's a tough book in a lot of ways because it's not just family dysfunction. These kids have really been damaged. Right. And you deal with it very delicately. Can you talk about how you decided to portray that and how far you decided to go? In Becoming Naomi Leon, Naomi and her little brother Owen were abandoned by their mother when they were very, very young. Owen was just a baby. And so the great-grandmother stepped in, and she embraced these children, and she protected them. And and so, you know, I didn't want to become graphic about abuse because I don't really know that that's what the mother did to them. It was more it was more neglect than anything. But, of course, that in itself is, is abuse. And so it was walking a fine line, how to portray that and how to portray it in a way that a child wouldn't be upset by it. And I felt like by showing the grandmother how strong she was and how responsible she was and how dedicated she was to loving them, that that would help make up for their circumstances. I like the relationship that Naomi has with her brother, who's really this quirky little kid. Well, Owen has some physical disabilities. He he was born with his head kind of scrunched up towards his shoulder, and he had to have some surgeries to help work out his spine and his neck. And he also has um, some little quirky (laughs) things about him. He has a security issue with scotch tape. He likes to have a a piece of scotch tape on him all the time. And he's a, a little bit of a savant as well, although people don't think he's that smart because he doesn't look that smart. He's a funny looking kid. So, you know, he was a combination of three little boys that I once knew. So this is Naomi's life. You know, she lives with her great-grandmother, and then she has this brother that's very quirky on many levels, and it's how she copes with it. Well, one way Naomi copes is by soap carving, and that becomes an integral part of the story. Right. How did it make its way into the book? First of all, Naomi doesn't speak much. It's not that she can't speak, but she's just very, very quiet. And I needed to give her an outlet, something to do. And several years before I wrote this book, I had been to Oaxaca for the 100th anniversary of the Night of the Radishes, which is a festival that they have there every year on the 23rd of December, where all the native woodcarvers come in and they carve these elaborate scenes out of hybrid radishes. So I had been to this festival, and I always thought that I wanted to use that event in a book. But I didn't know at that time what that would be. I didn't know if I would write a picture book about it or a nonfiction book. But I had set it on the back burner. So here I am writing Becoming Naomi Leon, and I have this young girl who who doesn't speak, who's painfully quiet, and I wanted to give her um, some sort of outlet, some sort of artistic outlet. And I remembered when I was a young girl in uh, Campfire Girls that we did activities with ivory soap where we carved figures. And so I thought, oh, maybe that would be interesting to give it to my character. And all of a sudden, the premise of soap carving and then the carving at the Night of the Radishes, it all sort of just coalesced. It, it, all of a sudden, I had a, a connection and an avenue where, where I could bring those two things together. How do you begin a book? Do you begin with a character, an idea, a picture in your mind? Well, I'm a very recursive writer, and I'll explain that in a second. And and the other thing is, for me, writing is more of an evolution, not so much a process. I think people always want to know, like, what's your process? Like, you know, exactly what do you do? Point A, point B, point... How do you organize the book? Do you outline? You know, do you do this? Do you put things on cards and put them up on the wall? I'm actually a very sort of evolutionary writer in the sense that I usually have that beginning opening scene in my mind and I write that scene 
And that scene rarely changes. I mean, I can't think in any of my novels where that scene has changed. I start writing, and then I stop. And the next day, I go back to the beginning, and I read, and I edit, and then I continue to write a little more, and then I stop, and then the next day, I go back to the beginning. So it's very recursive. I'm always going back to the beginning. I'm always rewriting and continuing to develop the book and the story. Now, of course, there comes a point where I can't do that any longer. So maybe I'll start at the halfway point and continue. Um, And it's also not to say that I never outline it, but I might do that as an exercise, or I might get to a point in the book where I think to myself, okay, what could or should happen? And I might make a list or an outline. I'm not married to that outline, but it helps me just sort of organize my thoughts. So I would say for me, writing is more of an evolution rather than a process. And I always, always start with that first scene. It's a scene I see in my mind. Now, what about a book like The Dreamer, which you you wrote and was beautifully illustrated by Peter Cease? How did you collaborate on that project? Well, it was done in a very traditional way, meaning that he was brought in after the manuscript was written. So I wrote the manuscript, and then my editor and the art director Um, considered having an illustrator illustrate portions of the novel. And then Peter was brought in. Yeah, and we we collaborated, in a sense, with the art director and the editor, you know, all of us together, the four of us. He would show us a variety of sketches for each illustration, and we would all discuss them and talk about them. He was wonderful. He was very sensitive and um, did a remarkable job. It's a beautiful, beautiful book to look at, which, uh, given the subject makes perfect sense, perfect aesthetic sense. And and tell us what The Dreamer is about. The Dreamer is about a little boy, Neftali Reyes, who lives in Tumuco, Chile. He's painfully shy. He has a very severe stutter. He lives with his very domineering and sometimes dictatorial and cruel father. And the story is about this very sort of sensitive child who copes with the world by collecting things from the forest, from the Chilean forest, and from the seaside where his family visits each year. And so he creates these collections. He seed pods and leaves and and then from the shore, you know, seabird skeletons and shells and and it's also his discovery of books also becomes a way for him to cope with his world, to sort of submerge himself in his own imagination. And all of these things, books and his collections and his forays, and really, even though he does have a sibling, siblings, he's really a very isolated and friendless child. So the whole story is about how Neftali Reyes learns to cope with his world. Neftali Reyes grows up to be the poet Pablo Neruda. And so The Dreamer is about the poet Pablo Neruda's young childhood. And this is a fictionalized account based on the facts of Neruda's childhood. Correct. That's correct. You did a great job describing the difficulties of his childhood, a father who was so authoritarian and rigid in his expectations of his kids, and in the world of your book, clearly ruined his oldest son. Right. I try to give a little insight onto the father about what his life was like. He didn't want his children to struggle as he struggled. And it was a different time. You know, it was a different time. It was a different country. There were cultural issues involved. So, yes, he was, he was difficult, and it did affect his children's lives. You know, in the three books that we've been talking about, and in, in other of your books as well, you also, it's very subtle, but you're also really looking at class issues. These aren't kids who have a lot of money. Money is always a struggle to some extent. I mean, even in, in the Neruda book, that's part of what is motivating his father, the fact that he Correct. grew up poor. Right. That's very rare to see. Oh, well, um, I'm glad you said it was subtle because I I meant it to be more matter-of-fact. And also I think it's really important for for young readers to read about a variety of circumstances. I want to portray our common humanity, and not everybody can be 
from one particular type of family. What do you find gratifying about writing for young readers? Well, first of all, I get wonderful letters. It's always really interesting to read their letters and find out the connections they've made with the stories because the connections aren't ever exactly a tight parallel. They're often very interpretive, and I think that's what's really so gratifying for me is to have a child open up about a circumstance based on reading my book because something in my book triggered a memory or a common incident in their lives. You know, I, it, it just makes me feel like I have a connection to them. So I think that's certainly very gratifying. It's also really gratifying to see how librarians and educators and teachers present the books and the activities they do with students to enrich the story. I'm always so surprised and honored at how they make the story come alive. So I'm really grateful for that. I mean, let's face it, they put my book in children's hands. And without them, could not continue to do what I do. Also, I think, man, those books that you read when you're young, they are with you for the rest of your life. Well, I think, honestly, when I look back on my life as a reader, I am writing for the age when books meant the most to me in my life and when they provided me with the most comfort, support, and escapism. I mean, that middle grade, fifth through ninth grade, those were the years that really books were my biggest comfort and my biggest way of coping. So it's interesting now to look back and to see that that is the sweet spot for me when it comes to writing. Pam, thank you for giving me your time, and thank you for these wonderful books. Well, I'm really grateful that you wanted to talk to me, and um, thank you so much. That's author Pam Munoz-Ryan. She's written over 40 books for children and young adults. We talked about The Dreamer, Becoming Naomi Leone, and Esperanza Rising. Her latest young adult novel, and it's another award winner, is called Echo. You've been listening to Artworks, produced at the National Endowment for the Arts. And now you can find the Artworks podcast on iTunes. If you like the podcast, please subscribe and give us a rating. It helps other people to find us. For the National Endowment for the Arts, I'm Josephine Reed. Thanks for listening.